This video is the first in a two-part series I'm putting together about the 10 best World Series of all time. Come with me and let's check out number six through 10. What is going on, everybody? Thanks for joining me on my channel, Brutus on Baseball. It is World Series time, October once again, and what better time to go over the history of World Series and pick out the 10 best. I'm gonna count down from 10 all the way to number one, so let's check them out right away. We have had a World Series almost every year since the current idea was established in 1903, and it was a challenge between the best team in the National League and the best team in the American League. The only seasons that did not see a World Series were 1904, when the New York Giants boycotted having to face the upstart American League, and then 1994 due to the player strike and the canceling of the World Series by Major League Baseball. But that gives us a total of 119 World Series to choose from, which is plenty to pick a list of top 10. The purpose of this video is to share with you my opinion on the 10 best World Series of all time. As a baseball fan, even if your team didn't make it to the World Series, the only thing you can ask for is an exciting and competitive championship that you can still root for. I didn't use any complex math formulas here to decide the rankings. I went with my gut when remembering back on them or reading about them in the case of ones that I didn't see. Not everyone will agree with me, but in my opinion, there are certain ingredients that always make for a great World Series. Those ingredients include, number one, the series has to go to game seven, meaning that the winner gets the glory and the loser goes home. If it doesn't go to game seven, it's not really that competitive. Number two, a lot of back and forth and lead changes throughout the series, whether in games one or within a game. Late inning comebacks and extra inning heroics are always really good to add to the recipe. Number three, game seven itself usually has to have been a nail biter. If you go on a roller coaster with lots of loops and twists and drops, but the last minute of the ride is a slow coast to the finish line, it still ends up a bit disappointing, doesn't it? So an incredible finish helps the memory last even longer. Number four, incredible, memorable events or individual performances always help, especially to cap off the series with an exclamation point. This isn't always the case, but it certainly helps. And number five, this one's huge to me, is that the home team wins. There's no better finish than watching the team celebrate on the field in front of their home crowd with the fans celebrating there too. It doesn't have to be the case to make a great World Series, but I think it makes it better to me. And then number six, an unexpected team winning. Having an underdog claim a victory against a perennial contender makes it that much sweeter for the rest of the baseball fans out there. So with that criteria in mind, I've ranked what I think are the 10 best World Series of all time. Let's start with my 10th best World Series. 1997, the Florida Marlins beating the Cleveland Indians. The 1997 World Series featured the upstart Marlins, a team patched together with free agent stars that would be disbanded later that same offseason in a massive fire sale. And they would go up against the Cleveland Indians, a really young slugging team that had just previously made the World Series only to lose in 1995, but who had been the laughing stock of the league for decades before that and hadn't won a championship since 1948. Game one would start in Florida. It would feature a young LeVon Hernandez who scattered runs but generally held the Indians lineup in check. And a Moises Alou three-run home run would drive the Marlins offense to send them to a 7-4 victory. Game two was more lopsided with Kevin Brown pitching a good game until the Indians got to him with a series of base hits to score three runs in the fifth inning and followed by a Sandy Alomar Jr. two-run shot in the sixth. While Chad OJ, on the other hand, was solid for Cleveland and led them to the 6-1 win. Game 3 would shift to Cleveland and was an absolute slugfest. 
Gary Sheffield started the scoring with a home run in the top of the first inning, followed by a string of singles and walks by the Indians to score two in the bottom of the first. Both starting pitchers were chased by the fifth inning, and it was tied up at seven all going into the ninth in what turned out to be a crazy inning. The ninth inning started with a series of three walks, four singles, and three errors all intermixed that resulted in the Marlins suddenly up 14 to seven. But the Indians wouldn't go quiet as they loaded the bases and proceeded to score four runs to cut the lead, but that's where it would stay as Omar Vizquel grounded out to end the game. Not to be outdone, Cleveland's offense responded with a blowout in Game 4, behind home runs from Manny Ramirez and Matt Williams to win the game 10-3 and even the series up. The teams would start strong out of the gates in Game 5, the last one in Cleveland, with Florida scoring two in the second inning and Cleveland responding with one in the second and a three-run shot from Sandy Alomar Jr. again in the third. But the Marlins wouldn't be outdone, as Moises Alou hit another three-run home run as well in the sixth inning to chase Oral Hershiser from the game and put the Marlins up 6-4. Florida would extend their lead with another run in the 8th and one more run in the ninth to put them up 8-4, but once again, Cleveland would not go quietly. The Indians would put runners on in the bottom of the ninth, and closer Rob Nen would give up a 2-RBI single to David Justice, followed by an RBI single from Jim Tomei to put the Indians within one run with runners on base. But Nen then got Alomar to fly out to end the game 8-7 and send the Marlins back to Florida with a 3 games to 2 lead. Game 6 featured a rematch between ace Kevin Brown for the Marlins against Chad OJ again for the Indians. Everyone figured that Brown would clinch the series for the Marlins, but again he struggled while OJ dealt. OJ even drove in the first two runs for the Indians himself, back when pitchers still hit in the National League stadiums during the World Series. Behind OJ, Cleveland would cruise to a 4-1 victory to even the series and force a Game 7. Game 7 would be a pitcher's duel between Al Leiter of the Marlins and young phenom Jarrett Wright of the Indians. The Indians would strike first, scoring two runs off a single by Tony Fernandez, while the Marlins wouldn't score until the bottom of the seventh when Bobby Bonilla hit the first pitch from right over the fence for a solo home run. The Indians threatened in the top of the ninth again, with runners at first and third with one out, but an incredible play by Edgar Renteria throwing to Charles Johnson to get the runner out at home kept the game close. Jose Mesa was brought into the bottom of the ninth to close out the game, but after allowing two singles, Craig Council hit a long fly ball that was caught at the wall, but allowed a run to score on the sacrifice fly to tie the game and send it to the 10th inning. Neither team would score in the 10th, and the Indians would be retired in the 11th to set up the wild finish. The Marlins loaded the bases in their half of the 11th inning, and after one runner was thrown out at home, Charles Nagy wouldn't be able to stop a line drive from Edgar Renteria that shot into center field to score the winning run for the Marlins. The Marlins would win a World Series only five years into their existence, and for the first time, the World Series trophy would be presented on the field in front of the home field fans. Number 9. The 1960 World Series between the Pittsburgh Pirates and the New York Yankees. The Yankees were the juggernaut in the midst of 22 World Series appearances in the 29 years between 1936 and 1964, including 16 championships during that time. The Pirates, on the other hand, hadn't even appeared in a World Series since losing to the Yankees in 1927 and hadn't won since 1925. Needless to say, the Yankees were heavy favorites going in. The Pirates went with Vern Law in Game 1, and for some reason, Casey Stengel decided to go with Art Dittmar rather than Whitey Ford to start Game 1. Dittmar wouldn't get out of the first inning, giving up three runs to the Pirates. Law would have a decent game, pitching seven innings and giving up two runs to hold off the powerful Yankees and win the game 6-4. But the Yankees wouldn't play around in Game 2, surging ahead of the Pirates behind two home runs from Mickey Mantle and destroying the Pirates 16-3. 
Finally starting Whitey Ford in Game 3, the Yankees would jump out again with six runs in the first inning and drive out the pirate starter behind a grand slam from Bobby Richardson, a moment that was certainly out of character for the typically light-hitting second baseman. Mickey Mantle would add another home run, and Whitey Ford would pitch a complete game shutout leaving the starter in the entire game for whatever reason and beating up on the Pirates again 10 to nothing. The Pirates would send Vern Law again to the mound for Game 4, and he would pitch effectively again over six in the third innings and squeezing past Ralph Terry in a close margin of a 3-2 to two win to even up the series for the Pirates. And not only that, but Vern Law would also drive in the Pirates' first run with an RBI double to start the scoring for them. The Yankees would send out Art Dittmar again for Game 5, and once again, he wouldn't get past the second inning, and the Pirates would see themselves up 4-2 to two by the end of the third inning. The Pirates' Harvey Haddix wouldn't give up another run, and the Pirates would squeak out another win, 5-2, to two, to suddenly go up in the series and threaten to send the Yankees packing. With their backs against the wall, though, the Yankees would again rely on Whitey Ford to pitch Game 6, and they would roll again behind him, blowing out the Pirates 12 to nothing and forcing at least a Game 7. With such an uneven series, Game 7 is what propelled this series into the top 10 of all time. The Pirates would go again with Vern Law, while the Yankees would send Bob Turley out to the mound. Turley would only get one inning in, as the Pirates scored four times in the first two innings to chase him. But the Yankees finally got to Law as well, chasing him in the sixth inning and scoring four runs and taking a 5-4 overall lead in the game. The Yankees would score twice more in the top of the eighth inning to take a 7-4 lead, but they couldn't hold back the Pirates as they then answered back with five runs in the bottom of the eighth in a series of infield hits and errors, finally followed up by a three-run home run from Hal Smith to put the Pirates up 9-7. The Yankees would come up in the top of their ninth, immediately put runners on base in front of Mickey Mantle, who singled to score a run, and then made a smart base running play to allow another run to score before the third out of the inning could be called. The Yankees had tied it up at nine all. Ralph Terry had been called on in relief, and the first batter up for the Pirates was defensive wizard and light-hitting second baseman Bill Mazeroski. On a 1-0 count, Mazeroski hit a laser line drive that sailed over Yogi Berra's head and cleared the wall in left field for the very first walk-off home run in World Series history. The Yankees were visibly stunned, and the Pirates celebrated in victory with their fans in Pittsburgh. Despite being outscored 55-27 in the series, the Pirates were crowned the champions. You have to wonder if any of this would have happened if Whitey Ford had been started earlier in the series and perhaps been available to pitch in Game 7. And in a crazy stat with respect to this day and age at least, Game 7 was the only game in all of postseason history where neither team recorded a single strikeout. And number 8 on my list the 2016 World Series between the Chicago Cubs and Cleveland Indians. The 2016 World Series featured an incredible matchup between two teams with the longest championship droughts in the game. The Cubs, who had not won since 1908, and the Indians, who had not won since 1948. The first two games in Cleveland didn't provide much drama, as the Indians took Game 1 behind Corey Kluber, 6 to nothing, and then the Cubs took Game 2 behind Jake Arrieta, 5 to 1. Game 3 featured a pitching duel, even though neither starter really lasted beyond the 5th inning. The game's only run came in the 7th inning on a single from Coco Crisp, and the Indians would take Game 3, 1 to nothing. The Indians would take Game 4-2 behind yet another strong start by Cora Kluber, as they would win 7-2 and go up three games to one in the series. Game 5 would feature John Lester versus Trevor Bauer, and the Cubs would score all the runs that they would need behind the bats of Chris Bryant, Anthony Rizzo, and Ben Zobrist to take the game 3-2. With the momentum shifted into Chicago's favor, they would march back into Cleveland for Game 6 and stomp all over the Indians, winning 9-3, behind a strong start from Jake Arrieta again, home runs from Chris Bryant, Anthony Rizzo, and a 6-RBI game from Addison Russell. 
This would set up a spectacular Game 7, which is the reason why the 2016 World Series is on this list. Starting pitchers Corey Kluber and Kyle Hendricks wouldn't last beyond the fifth inning in this game either, as the Cubs went ahead 5-3 after five innings. Chicago would score in the top of the sixth, and Cleveland would follow with three in the bottom of the eighth, behind a huge home run off the bat of Rajai Davis, against Cubs closer Araldus Chapman that even the score at 6-6. Six six. The Cubs squandered a perfect chance to go ahead in the ninth inning, but Francisco Lindor made an incredible play for the final out of that inning. The game went into the tenth inning which was delayed for 17 minutes by a sudden burst of rain that gave the Cubs' Jason Hayward a chance to revive his teammates' spirits with a motivational speech in the clubhouse that ignited the Cubs for two runs in the top of the 10th inning. The Indians did their best to survive as several players reached base, and even Rajai Davis came up again with a clutch base hit to put the Indians within one run. But. A previous questionable substitution resulted in the Indians' poorest hitter at bat with the game on the line, giving the Cubs their first world championship in 108 seasons, coming back from a three games to one deficit and winning the final two games on the road. The number seven series is the 1924 Washington Senators versus New York Giants. The 1924 World Series would feature the Washington Senators, the precursor to the Minnesota Twins, looking for their first world championship against the New York Giants, who were playing in their fourth consecutive World Series after winning in both 1921 and 1922. Game one featured pitchers Art Neff for the Giants versus future Hall of Famer Walter Johnson for the Senators. Senators, both of whom would go on to pitch the full 12 innings in the contest. The Giants were leading 2-1 to one until the Senators tied it at 2 with a double off the bat of Roger Peckinpah to score a run in the ninth inning. The game would go to the 12th inning, when the Giants scored two off of Walter Johnson behind Ross Young's bat. The Senators would come back with a run of their own in the bottom of the 12th inning, but they would strand the tying run at third base giving the Giants the win in Game 1. Game 2 would be another nail-biter, as Washington would start off strong with a two-run home run by Goose Goslin in the first inning. The Senators would be up 3 to nothing going into the 7th, but the Giants would claw back again, with one in the 7th and two more in the top of the ninth inning, behind hits from George High Pockets Kelly and Hack Wilson that would tie the game at 3-all. The Senators took the game in the bottom of the ninth, though, behind another run-scoring double from Roger Peckinpah again that won the game 4-3. to three. Game 3 shifted to New York, where the Giants took a two-games-to-one lead with a 6-4 to four victory, even with Washington attempting a comeback, scoring runs in the 8th and ninth innings before falling just short. Game 4 would be the opposite, with Washington evening up the series again with a 7-4 to four victory behind Goose Goslin's 4-4 four for four day with four RBIs. The Giants would take Game 5 against Walter Johnson with a score of 6-2, to two, putting the Giants up again three games to two as the series shifted back to DC. Game 6 would see the Giants go up quickly with a run in the first, but that's the only run that they would see all day as the Senators scored two in the fifth behind player manager Bucky Harris's bat, and the Senators would win a close one, 2-1, to one, to even the series up and force that Game 7. In the deciding Game 7, the Senators would score one in the fourth, the Giants would score three in the sixth, and the Senators would even it up in the bottom of the eighth to eventually send the game into extra innings. Walter Johnson would actually be brought in to pitch the last four innings of the game in relief, shutting down the Giants through the 12th. The Senators would score the winning run in the bottom of the 12th on a couple of light hit balls and errors from the Giants, giving the Senators their only World Series victory while in Washington, with the fans able to see it firsthand. The number six series on my list is 2011, featuring the St. Louis Cardinals and the Texas Rangers. Game one started in St. Louis and featured C.J. Wilson against Chris Carpenter. The scoring would start in the fourth inning on a two-run single from Lance Berkman. 
But in the top of the fifth, the Rangers would come back with a two-run home run from Mike Napoli. The Cardinals would score once more in the bottom of the sixth, and that's how the game would end, with the Cardinals winning 3-2. Game two would be a pitching duel between Jaime Garcia and Colby Lewis. Garcia would pitch six scoreless innings until he was lifted in the seventh for a pinch hitter, Alan Craig, who singled to right field to drive in David Fries with the first run of the game. That single run would be the end of Colby Lewis's night, and the bullpens held the game at one to nothing until the top of the ninth inning. After two singles to start the ninth inning, the Rangers went up two to one behind sacrifice flies from Josh Hamilton and Michael Young, and would shut down the Cardinals in the bottom half of the inning to take game two. Game three would shift to Texas and would feature a blowout, with the Cardinals winning 16-7 behind a three-home run game from Albert Pujols. But Texas would get even in game four, with a 4 to nothing shutout behind Derek Holland's eight and a third scoreless innings and a three-run home run from Mike Napoli again. Game five was a messy game, taken by the Rangers 4-2 in large part to a series of mix-up in the Cardinals' bullpen that sent the wrong relievers into the game at the wrong times. The series would move back to St. Louis, with the Rangers up three games to two, and Game 6 would prove to be the most exciting game of the series. The teams would trade runs almost immediately, with the Rangers scoring one in the first and the Cardinals following up with two in the bottom half of the first inning for them. The Rangers would score one run again in the second, the fourth, and the fifth innings, while the Cardinals would score one run in the fourth and sixth innings as well. The Rangers would try to break it open in the seventh with back-to-back -back home runs by Adrian Beltre and Nelson Cruz and an insurance run on a double from Ian Kinsler. But the Cardinals scored again in the eighth and then in the bottom of the ninth inning the Rangers brought in Neftali Feliz up by two to nail down their first World Series championship. Feliz had an up and down inning, getting two outs but also giving up a double to Pujols and a walk to Berkman. With two on and two out, the Rangers were one strike away from winning it all when David Freeze roped the ball off the right field wall for a triple, tying the game and sending it into extra innings. The Rangers looked poised to win in the 10th, behind a two-run home run from Josh Hamilton that put them back up 9-7. But in the bottom of the 10th, the Cardinals opened with two singles and plated a run using a small ball. The Rangers were once again one strike away, though, from the championship when Berkman laced a single to center field to score the tying run and send it into the 11th inning. The Rangers went scoreless in their half of the 11th, and in the bottom of the 11th, the Cards sent David Freeze to the plate again, the hero of the ninth inning. Freeze proceeded to launch a home run into the center field batter's eye to win the game 10-9 and force a Game 7. The Rangers came out strong in Game 7, with two runs in the top of the first inning. But that's all they would manage the entire game, as the Cardinals also scored two in the bottom of the first, and then went on to tack on four more runs throughout the game to win 6-2. to two. David Fries, a hometown kid who grew up in St. Louis as a Cardinal fan, would win the championship and the World Series MVP in front of the hometown fans. So there you have it. In my opinion, the 6th to the 10th best World Series of all time. Be sure to check back next week for my top 5. And in the meantime, enjoy the 2024 World Series, keep talking baseball, and we'll see you around.